Okay, and I 20 plus questions, so yeah, all right. Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, 20th edition of uh, of the sake. Well, still people are, are coming in. We have a really tight uh, schedule today, so we're going to start um, already. Also, welcome for everyone um, that's watching us via the, the stream. Uh, we're really happy we could make it in time because our cables got lost here. And well, this is still not a wireless setup, so we'll put in the uh, investment request for that uh, uh, after this uh, this meeting. So. Um, to uh, not waste too much of our time, uh, we're going to continue with uh, the security topic, as uh, Kai already introduced. Uh, security is really important for um, uh, for Sanama, and one of the partners we work with is uh, is Nixu. And Antti from Nixu is kind enough to uh, come us uh, come tell us about the latest um, uh, vulnerabilities that have been um, uh, yeah been coming out lately. So uh, please give a round of applause for Antti and take it away. Thank you. So just a sound check, can you? hear me and it's okay very good yeah so uh, hello everybody i'm Antti Nuopponen have been working for past five years uh, managing the incident response and forensic team at Nixu providing the service also here and today i was asked to talk about the most recent security vulnerabilities i did some digging around uh, figuring out okay what's relevant what's something that you want to hear and i found that there's actually one product that had had 37 critical vulnerabilities in past two months. Any guess what that is? Well, flash, of course. So I calculated of if I start going through all these vulnerabilities, I have like 30 seconds for each. And well, no, I'm not going to do that because we all know that flash is vulnerable. You should really not use it if you ask me, because um, it's like asking somebody to hack you if you have flash installed. Instead, I went and look for something more interesting, something that might be relevant. Hopefully it is. And I came up with these three things that I'm going to cover today. So the cyborg looking thing on the left is a webcam linked to a large denial of service attack that happened a while ago. Then Apple, yeah, I think we all, our common understanding is that Apple devices, iOS, that they are quite secure and you are safe when using them. And that has changed, at least in some as aspect lately. And third, maybe the most technical one, maybe a little demo at the end, is the dirty cow, which is a Linux privilege escalation bug. But if we start um, from the this, uh, denial of service attack, on October 21st, we saw news, for example, from the CNN, that is large scale denial of service attack that bring brought down like Twitter, Netflix, they estimated that the bandwidth used there was 1.2 uh, terabits per second. So we saw the numbers just that you have been facing, and this is like, what, 10, 20, 30 times higher. So it was a huge thing. So who did it? I mean, to be able to pull up something like that, are you a nation states kind of government attacker or somebody that has really huge resources? Well, this a question was asked from a bunch of researchers, security experts, and the answer was it was kids. For example, Mikko Hyppönen said that it was just a bunch of kids that had the resources and didn't know what to do with them. So they decided to do those a uh, couple big players. So how come a bunch of uh, kids do this kind of attacks, bring down Twitter, have ability to uh, spend 1.2 terabytes or terabits per second traffic? Answer is here. There is a Mirai botnet. So um, this is a piece of malware uh, that was made actually publicly available. So it's uh, malware that infects all sort of IoT devices, home routers, these uh, wireless cameras, you name it. And the author posted this public, uh, was it late September, yes? Uh, and made this announcement saying that, okay, this is enough for me, I'm out of this business, have this code, play with it. He also, or he or she, nobody knows, uh, says that um, it can easily build a botnet with like 300,000 uh, devices easily, just by at attacking Telnet. And how it is possible? Well, this is something that came out quite uh, fast after the incident. There's a Chinese company, Xiaomai Technology, which makes the for example, the web camera that I showed, they recalled 
was it 4.3 million devices because they are not able to patch them at all. So they need to recall it. And what was the vulnerability so serious that they cannot patch it? Th that's interesting. I mean, there must be something kind of uh, cool there. This is from Day's statement. Sa they said that the biggest security problem is that people are not changing their passwords. So it made me think that, okay, if you are making a consumer product or service and your security relies on the end user, you are probably going to be screwed. And as they were. So this is actually what the source code has. Uh, I looked it, read the code. It looks like something that I have written when I was a teenager. So in a sense, that makes sense that it was a bunch of teenagers. Ac ugly C code with a bunch of hard-coded usernames and passwords. And with this kind of uh, malware, you can compromise hundreds of thousands of devices and start making DDoSs that are this big. Makes me at least wonder about the vendor responsibility, what we learn from here. If it's okay to make a device as cheap as can sell it and then by default is unsecure, we will see things like that. So what should be done instead, at least I feel that governments, officials, EU should enforce regulations that they are just not able to ship this kind of devices. So there should be a kind of some penalties if they make devices that are for consumers that are this unsecure. So because people are lazy, they will buy the product, install it and then never touch it. So that's why it's so easy. And if things are not changing, we will see more like things like this. This was last week. Mirai was again used to bring down basically the whole country. So maybe the same uh, kids, maybe somebody else who took the code, uh, just wipe Liberia out of the internet for a while, just because they could. At least I'm a bit worried that what we will see next if kind of things are not changing. But then to the more technical stuff, more interesting stuff, I would say high advanced. In iOS, as said, at least I thought that when using iPhone with the kind of kind latest patches, it's secure, more secure than Android. They have these closed uh, ecosystems where you can only install stuff from Apple Store, so it protects you from installing malware and stuff. But then a while ago, it was in August, there was the news that there's actually a uh, bunch of well, exploitable vulnerabilities I in I iOS that allow you to hijack iPhones. They were patched with uh, iOS update 935, these three vulnerabilities. In a sense, the first one allows you to hijack the phone if the end user just clicks one link. Okay, that doesn't require that much. You send an SMS message or email to people, click a link and the phone is owned. Then the second two allow the attacker to basically jailbreak the device without the end user seeing it and install uh, surveillance components there without you seeing it. And this was actually done. An Israeli company made a product called Pegasus, which is a um, surveillance software sold to uh, well, anybody who has money, government officials, uh, and it allows you to basically hack iPhones uh, or iOS devices and give you full access. I mean, you get, get the audio, you can turn the phone into a wireless uh, mic, you can listen to conversation, you can intercept uh, WhatsApp messi uh, application messages, get the GPS location, everything. So full control. And it has been used at least according to the researchers that made this public. So uh, for example, against high value targets like human rights activists and, and also in espionage cases. But this was patched two months ago and now, or three months ago, give or take, two months later, we had another one. iOS 10 had a yet another critical security vulnerabilities. Just by opening a JPEG image, your device could have been owned, totally owned. This is a newer one, haven't seen active exploits or attackers using this one yet but I would be surprised if the same guys who are making the surveillance guys are not using it. So really, really interesting stuff. And of course, this doesn't mean that iOS would be less secure than Android, but still makes, thing makes me, me think how I use the phone and, and uh, what applications I run there.
Then to the third one, this is a little bit different kind of beast. The dirty cow Linux kernel builds escalation, um, kind of um, well affects all, pretty much all the Linux variations, Android as well, and it allows you to basically well get from the normal user to the root user. It is a uh, kind of race condition how the memory handling works there. To be honest, I haven't been doing the real hand code. Uh, uh, coding myself so I don't understand all the bits and pieces there. But what's interesting is that this uh, bug was introduced nine years ago. So for nine years pretty much all the Linux distributions have been vulnerable. Who knows um, who has been using this and how it has been used. There is working proof of concept code available and I'm gonna show you a little bit how it works and how easy or difficult it is to use. And why this is Im uh, important? Um, if, for example, you are hosting, let's say, Linux servers, having services that are running Linux, uh, WordPress, something that allows well attackers to compromise the first level, then usually you have, uh, um, well, the web services are running as a different user. But when the attacker gains access, gains some access to the computer, then with these kind of vulnerabilities, then they can actually escalate their privileges and the whole game is lost. But so that I don't spend all time, let's see if I can get the demo working. Now I have to sit down so that I can actually operate. Hmm? I guess it's big enough. So um, I have here a Linux machine, virtual machine, which I have connected with this account demo. So I'm the demo and I have here uh, basically two pieces of source code that are containing uh, two variants of this attack and then just a short script to compile it. And I have this fun file that is owned by the root user. I can check the content. So just a text file I created. If I try to, let's see, edit it some some way, it's read only. Cannot do it. Then, let's see. The first one, the cow root, is an automated version where you can just by basically running it, you can get the root privileges. And then the other one, the dirty C zero W is a script that allows you to write these files. So let's compile them. Well, let, let's first actually see them, uh, if somebody's interesting how it looks like. So there's a... And this is just downloaded from the internet. Uh, didn't need to Google much. It's like uh, 100 lines of code. If we go to the end, uh, maybe the font is just too small. But yeah, like 110 lines of code creates a couple threads and then creates this race condition and allows you to bypass then the uh, read only limitations. But let's see in practice. Uh, let me if I can compile it. Yeah, not error free code, but who cares? Uh, yeah, so it was just like GCC couple uh, and compiling the boat. Now I have here the binaries and the first one I will r modify the root file. So let's see. Dirty cow. Then I get the f give the file name and the new content of the file. Start it. It runs for a while, but usually I can just quit it and then see the content of the root file. So. It started from the beginning of the file and rewrote it, even if it was read-only. Well, this is quite, quite nice. You could use this to kind of uh, change uh, scripts that are like uh, uh, pseudo scripts or, or things like that. But then it's quite difficult. You can just also run the cow root and voila, who am I? I'm root. And it actually does it so that it rewrites the user uh, bin password vd command and uses that. And I need to restore it 
if I don't want my machine to break down completely. So it makes a copy to the temp directory. Uh, where do I put it? User bin password. Here I am. Yep. What else? But it's interesting, while I was actually investigating this bug, I came across an article that uh, said that in average, a li Linux, for example, kernel or Linux bugs, the time that they live, so that when they are first introduced, by the time they are fixed, I think it was five years. So it's quite long time. And it doesn't mean that they are, uh, it takes five years from the discovery to the fixing, but from the introductory. And even it's an open source system, everybody can freely see it. There's so much code that it's in reality, these things are not found in time. And I'm just make me makes me think that what the big guys have found and what they already know about, for example, Linux. Curious thought. But yeah, that was what I had in mind don't know how much time I spent, but I think there will be time for questions. <laughs> we have five minutes for questions. In yep. the meanwhile, uh, could you start setting up? You're the next speaker, right? Yep, I can unblock this one. Any questions for Antti? Oh, question. Yeah. Maybe a very stupid one, but mm. how do this these guys find out these items? Because, I mean... <laughs> Oh it's kind of far-fetched to go uh, out and look for something like that. Oh, you mean the, the dirty cow yeah. stuff? Yeah, I, have I think it was some researcher, don't know actually uh, how the kind of the details that wasn't discovered of how they do, but I think they are a bunch of uh, researchers, security guys that are looking for things. But it's... Is it a system or is it just... Yeah. Is it just like they go out and try stuff? I think this both. There are, there are uh, people like, well, for example, Oulu University, they, they have uh, researchers that are fussing the code, so trying different kind of inputs and mm -hmm. looking for crashes. And when crashes happen, uh, then they trace back that, okay, why it crashed? And usually when you are able to crash something, then there might be something that you can exploit. Yeah. So I think that's the kind of usual way. And then some guys, when they are just, well, by reading it, but that's slower because you have uh, like so much code that just reading it through, it's not obvious. Okay, thanks. Okay. Question in the back, one sec. All right. You mentioned that. Is that on? Yeah. No, yeah. all right. It's, it's for the people yeah. in the yeah. cloud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the main uh, vulnerability on the IoT apps was that people didn't change their username? Yeah, that was the comment from the. Well, there's actually more to into that, but it's like uh, the manufacturer of the Chinese manufacturer said that that's from their perspective that people are stupid and don't change the password. But in reality, there were devices that you couldn't change the password if even if you liked to. So there was at least a bunch of products were built in a way that there was web interface and then SSH telnet. You could change the username and password for the web interface, but not to the SSH or telnet. So it was just when you put the uh, machine into the network, there was no way of making it secure. But even if you remove that and just go to the people who didn't update it, yeah, is it your understanding? You said that you thought government regulations would prevent that. Is it your understanding that government right now saw that as a threat before the attack and would have put that regulation in mm. ahead of time? No, I think they. I mean, they it has. There has been talk, talks, uh, talks about it, but I didn't. They didn't realize that how big it can be. So if they didn't realize it, how would more regulation prevent the problem we're trying to prevent? Well, uh, I think like uh, in, in a sense that if you are selling, let's say, these commercial uh, consumer products in EU countries, I think in you should be uh, kind of uh, responsible of making them secure by design so that when an end user buys it, installs into home, that it cannot be hacked like that. So that it cannot have default passwords. In it has to have security features and functionalities that when you install it, it, for example, creates random passwords and give it to you and simple things like that. And if companies are not kind of complying with that and just making the cheapest ones without any security, then they should be re uh, responsible, maybe like fines 
we are talking about the EU data privacy thing, so that if companies are not handling uh, privacy information, then they could get huge fines. So kind of similar things, because if there is no uh, downside for the companies, the, uh, the consumer products, because they are just made as cheap as possible, then the all the security functions features, they just add cost. So there's really no motivation because end users are not asking for it. They are not buying the camera because of the security features, but they are buying it just because it works. So you're suggesting less regulation and more penalties on failure? Mm, yeah, could be. Okay. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but something somebody has to do something. <laughs> Thanks. Final question for Antti? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. So the examples that you were using are yep. from uh, software that somebody far away from us has created. Yes. If we are building software, uh, what's your advice for us? Well, I think it's a pretty similar thing. I mean, even if it's uh, like a service, if you are creating a service, you should assume that, uh, that end users are lazy. They will do the minimum when they take it into use. And that minimum should be the secure way. So, for example, uh, f enforcing them to have a proper password, so just not allowing these like uh, anti-anti combinations or things like that. But you should enforce certain criteria because people are lazy, they use the simple ones. Of course, it's a balancing act between the usability and then the security. But th th the overall principle that it's everything should be s uh, secure by design, that helps. Okay, cool. Please give a round of applause for Antti. Thank you.